Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 15th of January, 2018. We had two questions for our question and answer session this week. First one is from Steve. I'd like to ask to see the workflow of having a Premiere Pro sequence brought into Audition, edited there, then moved back to Premiere Pro. I see this done by you and in other videos, but it just doesn't work right for me. Is this something you'd be willing to demonstrate? So uh, a few caveats before we start on this one, Steve. I have not edited with Premiere Pro for about three years, so it's not my normal process. Um, but let me show you kind of the basics here and see if this kind of gets you off and running, at least to maybe assess if you're having some sort of technical issue with the installation of Premiere Pro and or Aud Audition on your computer, um, or if it's just you needed a little, I guess, quick run through. But in any case, um, I have a very simple sequence here, again, because I don't have any recent projects <laughs> in Premiere Pro. I just have a couple of clips that I've synced the audio to. Um, this is a corporate piece I worked on just a few months ago. And um, it is basically just have a stereo mix with each of the clips and it goes something like this. Flight that I was on in the early 90s, sitting next to this guy who's telling me that... And then the second clip. Own the entire travel experience on a true retail platform. There are actually two things you can do with Adobe Dynamic Link, um, and that allows you to transfer assets, in this case video and audio, uh, over into Audition. And the most recent versions actually do something a little different. Originally what they did is you essentially exported the audio and a kind of proxy video file, and then you brought those into Audition, and you could watch the proxy video file while you were editing the audio, um, that worked okay. This is a much better way now. They actually have essentially a pipeline that uh, where Premiere is still producing or actually displaying the video, but it does it within Audition and they're somehow dynamically linked. So it's pretty cool. First of all, we make sure our sequence is selected. That's indicated here by the blue box. Just click in this window here or this part of the window here. If you don't have that, come up to Edit, down to Edit in Adobe Audition. And right now, clip is grayed out, um, and we have the option for sequence. Let's kind of describe that first of all. If you just wanted to clean up a single clip, you could highlight that clip, come over here, and choose clip. This would just bring that single clip over into Audition. As soon as you're done editing it, you click Save in Audition, and it's updated here. That simple. So that's the first way to do that. And let me just demonstrate that here. So for example, we will bring this over in Audition, and here it is. And let's just say we wanted to loudness normalize that, but we would do it in a proper way. I'm going to click Save. We come right back over, and boom, you can see now that it's updated. Okay, let's undo that. Now, if I wanted to edit the entire sequence, which is what you asked specifically, again, just make sure our sequence is highlighted, Edit, Edit in Adobe Audition, Sequence. Now, before it does this, it gives you some options here. Presumably what you're doing here, of course, is that you have finished your edit, and now you wanna go and finish the audio over in Audition, where you have a little bit more control, more tools available to you. And so you get a few options here. First of all, you can choose a path, because what it's essentially going to do is it's going to save a copy of this that you can then use. Um, you get to choose what you're going to bring over. In this case, you could do entire selection, or if you had chosen an in and out point, you could just send that portion. We're of course going to send it through dynamic link. You could do it the old style way, which is to export a preview video uh, separately, um, but we'll just go ahead and use a new feature here. You also get to choose your audio handles. Now, this is an important setting actually. It's set for one by default. Um, this is somewhat of a matter of preference, but I think in most cases, I like to do something more like five or maybe even 10 seconds. And what that does is that when you're editing over in Audition, sometimes you need a little bit of extra audio that got clipped off or cut off, um, a leader or a header or a footer, and you want to get that audio back for various reasons. You might want to use the room tone on that. Uh, it might make some of the transitions a little bit smoother, things of that nature. So I like to bring at least a few seconds over. And if you're working on a feature film, I like to bring even more over if I can, like more like 10 seconds. Sometimes it's not all that useful, but it can't hurt, and especially today with the Price of storage coming down quite a lot. It's not a big deal to do that. Again, we're dealing with audio, which is much smaller than most raw footage that you could get out of cameras. So usually this works pretty nicely. Okay, next up, the you get options to transfer over the audio clip effects and the audio track effects if you've applied any of those. And usually I like to go ahead and bring those over if the editor in particular has already applied some things. If not, it doesn't really matter. 
Um, you can also bring over the pan and volume automation information. So for example, if you've come in here and you have put in some keyframes, then you can actually, and, you know, sort of automated the audio, like maybe dipped it down here and brought it back up here to duck some dialogue or something, whatever you've done. You can bring that information over and then of course open it in Adobe Audition. So let's go ahead and click OK. All right, now you'll notice here, instead of bringing it into the normal waveform editor, it's actually brought it over into the multi-track interface. And that's uh, that's good because that's typically where you're going to do mixing. Um, and here we have our entire clip. So here's the first clip and here's the second clip. You can actually see all that here. Um, once I've made some changes on all of this, what I can do then is export it back. So let's go ahead and put a very obvious change here. I'm not going to run through the entire process of actually mixing this because we don't have time for that today. But I've actually been thinking of doing a course this year on how to do post mixing. And we'll go into a lot more detail when we get onto that. But let's just put a really kind of heavy reverb on here, just so that it's very obvious. And here's what it sounds like now. I mean, I still remember that flight that I was on in the early 90s. Good. Okay. So let's go ahead and save that. That is just fine. And then we're going to export it to Adobe Premiere Pro. It's going to ask a couple of questions again. Uh, we're going to, it's going to take it over as an XML. And here's where it's going to be saved. You get to choose the sample rate. Now you have a couple of main options here to either one, export each track as a stem, which you can do. And what that means is that it will take each track and it will keep it separate as it takes it back over to Premiere Pro. In some cases, you may want to do that for, for whatever reason. You can do that if you choose to. Uh, the other option is to mix down the session to either a mono file, a stereo file, or a 5.1 file, or all three of those if you need to do that as well. And sometimes, for example, when you're working on a film, you actually may want a stereo and a 5.1 file because you're going to potentially deliver a mix of the film for 5.1 surround or one for stereo. So you may want both of those. In our case, we'll just say a stereo file. Go ahead and click export. You have to choose where you want to put it, where you want to put that audio. And we just want to put it as a new audio track here in Premiere. So we'll click that. Now what I can do here is let's solo this and just make sure it applied our changes. I mean, I still remember that flight that I was on. Sure did. So that's how you would go about doing that. Now at this point, you're gonna have to make some decisions. Do you want to even keep this audio? Um, normally you would probably keep it and just mute these tracks. So that when you do the final export, this is what you'll be hearing, the one that you worked in on in Audition. Um, but if for some reason you wanted to get rid of those, you could do that as well. So that's the overall kind of high level process of how Dynamic Link works between Premiere Pro and Adobe Audition. So hopefully that answers your question, Steve. If I missed anything there, go ahead and let me know and we can come back and revisit that in a little bit more detail. Our next question is from Joseph. I wanted to thank you for all the instructional videos regarding audio sound and especially the field mixers. I've been using the Zoom H4n and then the H6 for dialogue and I have now recently took the leap and purchased the Sound Devices 633. I have a question on the difference between using the left and right mix versus the ISOs when to use them for certain situations and how they would appear in Final Cut Pro 10 that I see for editing. Thanks for your help. You're great. Love all your review, the reviews. Okay, Joseph, that's a very good question. Let's come back over here. I have recorded, as it turns out, a very simple interview here. And I have two microphones, but you will see that we actually have four different tracks, uh, four different channels within this poly wave file. It's called a poly wave file when you have multiple channels represented here. Um, the first two, as is typical on professional level recorders, are the left and the right mixed channels. I'll come back and explain that in a little bit more detail. The third one is the first microphone, and the fourth one is the second microphone. So you can see here that we've actually done a mix because, remember, the mix here is actually a sum of the two isolated tracks down here. And you'll notice here on the um, isolated tracks, you'll see that these are already mixed some. This was actually using the uh, auto mix, the Dugan auto mix feature on the Sound Devices 633, which if you have a 633, I highly recommend you do some experimenting with it. This can be an amazing thing to work with. Um, but it also does some things here. You can see 
that you may not want. So it's really important to understand how this works so you can decide whether or not you really want to use it. Um, so again, this is the isolated first microphone, isolated second microphone. In this case, um, they're actually going to be called Boom and LAV1. You'll see that when we come over into Final Cut Pro 10. And then this will be mix left and mix right. So again, the mix channels here are a sum of these two. Now you'll notice also as part of the mix, what I did is I actually left the this, each of these channels panned to the center. So um, that what that means in practical terms is that the left mix and the right mix are exactly the same. In some cases, you will want to pan one of the channels to the left or right, and that'll be represented. Uh, you'll be able to see that here in the mix channels. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of an overview of what we're working with here. Let's come over into Final Cut and let's show you what happened there. When I imported this file into Final Cut, let's just say, let's get the whole thing here. And we'll just drop this down here. You'll notice here, uh, when I come over here into my inspector, here is the overall mix. On the next channel, you can see it actually says mix left, mix right, boom, and law of one. This is really fantastic. Final Cut Pro 10 reads all of the metadata that is actually written by the recorder for these individual tracks. And you can do this on the Zoom F series, of course. You can do it on the Mix Pre series from Sound Devices. You can do it on the 633 series and, or all of the 600 series in the Sound Devices. And other professional grade mixers can do that as well. This is awesome. So now you actually can see all of them. But you might be saying, well, I don't see them over here. I just see one track over here. Um, you can break them down, but if you're over here in the inspector and for whatever reason you may want to turn off the stereo mix, you just uncheck those. Now you're just going to hear the isolated channels. So that's pretty cool. Now, what if you actually wanted to kind of get into more detail and actually edit them and actually cut individual pieces out of each of the channels? You can do that as well. Just come over here and expand the audio components and you can see all of them here. What's interesting too, as far as roles are concerned, if I right click here on the mix left, if I look at the audio rows, you can see this was assigned to mix left as far as the in the dialogue audio roll as the mix left roll. This is actually creating a new roll here. This one you can see likewise, mix right. This one is assigned to boom and this one to lav. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so I could actually just completely pull the uh, mute one of them entirely. Again, I don't, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about this. As someone who does audio, I don't necessarily rely on Final Cut Pro to do all of my audio editing, especially if I'm working, for example, on a, a film, like a short film or even a feature film. Um, it's made a lot of good strides and it's come a long way, but I don't actually generally do this level of editing in here. But that just sort of hopefully, let me just undo that, kind of gives you some sense for how Final Cut Pro 10 works with audio. We can also go ahead and collapse this again, I believe. Yeah. Um, so there, there's that. Let me um, talk about another part of your question, which was, okay, when do I use the mix, the left and right mix versus the isolated channels? Um, that is a very fine question. And I think it's really important to understand that. So let me give you kind of the history and this will give you some background information on when you might want to use it or not use the, the mix channels as well. But in films with a budget, typically when you have a larger crew and you have a separate post crew, um, typically what's happening here is that the production sound mixer will actually create a left and right mix and record the isolated channels. And then for the dailies, every day, uh, every morning on a production day, they'll usually show dailies from the previous day. And that's for the director and the rest of the crew to make sure that, hey, we got all the shots we needed, um, or we may need to reshoot some of them today because we didn't quite get the right everything right on one of the takes, perhaps, or whatever it was, or for one of the scenes. So whomever on the crew is going to be responsible for creating those dailies will usually take the left and right mix from the audio. They'll probably just ignore the ISOs in most cases. They'll take the left and right mix, and they will sync those up to picture, and that's the audio that will be used in the dailies if they're going to do that kind of workflow. So that's one case where you would want to use the left and right mix. And then what happens in post is they'll take those dailies and then the post sound people still have the isolated channels so that if the mix wasn't exactly how they wanted it, and in many cases they, it isn't, um, <laughs> 
um, just because it's so hard to mix live or you know during the actual recording process. It's very difficult to get that perfectly right. So in a lot of times they'll they'll actually cut out some of the left and right mix or maybe even all of it and paste in the isolated channels as individual actors are speaking. So for example, if you have a scene where you have two actors speaking to each other, they're actually going to do what's called railroad um, those tracks and spotting them in the dialogue edit. Um, so what that means in practical terms is that when actor one is working or talking, the only audio track that's still going to be in the timeline is that actor's microphone, whichever one they choose, whether they're going to use the boom microphone for that person or the lav microphone for that person, whatever it is. But the other actor's microphone will be completely cut out for that section where actor one is talking. Um, so that's where the isolated tra tracks come in. If you're going to get in and do a really detailed, very careful, very high production value type of edit and mix, um, that's where you're going to use the isolated channels. Or you could just use them as backup if in case something did go wrong with the mix. Another scenario for where you want to use the left and right mix is if you have a very quick turnaround. So sometimes for TV, for example, or whatever project you may be working on, if they need to turn it around and be able to distribute it very quickly, you don't necessarily have time to go in and do the full feature film type of audio post workflow. And in that case, you'll just use the left and right mix. I will say this, under very few circumstances, and I can't think of any circumstances, would you want to keep in your final mix with the video, both the left and right mix and the ISOs. It just, um, all, all at once at least. Um, you can cut back and forth between them, but you don't want to just leave them all in there for the entire duration of the piece. Um, I hope that makes sense. And the reason you don't want to do that, of course, is that if you do, it doesn't sound richer. That's actually what I thought when I first was getting started in audio. The more microphones, the richer the sound. Well, no, really what happens is the more microphones, the more phase issues you run into. And phase just creates artifacts and strange sounding stuff. And you don't generally want that. So, um, Hopefully that answers your question, Joseph. It's a really good question. It's a really deep one, and we could talk about it for hours and hours and hours. And I'm actually, again, looking to create a course this summer that talks about post-mixing and kind of answers this question in a little bit more detail. So those are the questions for this week. I hope that was helpful. Thanks for asking them. Hope all of you are out there making some great recordings, and we'll talk to you again next week. 